after uh, after the last two um, IANA uh, allocations went to uh, Lacknick, Bob Hinden sent uh, Vince Cerf an email, and CC Lorenzo and I, and this was uh, Vince Cerf's response. <laughs> Sick transit glory mundi. So passes the glory of the world. And uh, indeed, the Yana free pool is now the, the lines have crossed. So, and uh, Vint uh, has uh, recorded, uh, he couldn't be here today, but he has recorded uh, an address uh, to, uh, to play for everyone. Hopefully this will. And uh, well, in theory, this is streaming over V6. Hi, I'm Vince Cerf. I'm Google's chief internet evangelist, and I wish I could join you today at the IPv6 meeting, but unfortunately my calendar uh, didn't permit it. Uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity to take a moment to talk to you about what's on my mind right now uh, about IPv6. First of all, I'm sure you know that Google has uh, made substantial progress in implementing IPv6 for uh, all of our services, and a lot of credit for this goes to Lorenzo Coletti and Eric Klein, Stephen Stewart, and others uh, who have worked hard to find all the places in our software where uh, IP addresses were thought to be 32 bits, and we want them to be also 128, so we've been looking at dual stack kinds of implementations. <laughs> But what I really wanted to talk to you about today is my concern that we're now down below the 10% level with IPv4 available addresses coming from uh, ICANN, from IANA. And that uh, certainly within a year's time, uh, the IANA allocations will have been exhausted. Uh, the regional internet registries uh, may be able to um, allocate IPv4 addresses uh, up until perhaps the middle of 2011. Although if there's a big run uh, on uh, IPv4 addresses uh, or uh, other kinds of things happen, it's conceivable that uh, the available space will be consumed even faster, which will undoubtedly uh, introduce a complex and already uh, growing gray or black market on IPv4 address space, uh, leading to fragmentation, increases in the size of you know, the routing tables and the like. So plainly, uh, we are at a cusp, I think, in uh, the IP address space uh, for Internet. What I'd like to ask you to do uh, while you're discussing uh, IPv6 and a variety of issues associated with it is to give some thought to the various players who are part of this uh, IPv6 environment and what they will have to do in order to make IPv6 work as uh, conveniently and as broadly as IPv4 does today. Plainly, the ISPs have got to implement IPv6 services, preferably uh, uh, using the same uh, access lines as they uh, currently deliver IPv4 addresses on and, and allow the two to be mixed together. Uh, they have to also, uh, I think, adopt liberal interconnection policies. And the minimum, in my view, uh, would be to allow IPv6 and IPv4 to flow over the same connections. Uh, you know, if you've already concluded to do uh, some kind of peering on, uh, on, uh, with IPv4, uh, it would be very reasonable, I think, to also peer with IPv6 on those same uh, connection circuits. There are some uh, arguments about peering versus transit. Uh, in my view, uh, the traffic levels are, uh, in a sense, rivals. That is to say, if you're using IPv6, you're uh, consuming capacity that would otherwise have been sent on IPv4, and I don't think the two are independent. Consequently, even if you're um, acquiring IPv4 connectivity through transit, uh, I would have thought that IPv6 connectivity over the same line would not increase uh, the capacity. Uh, that you require nor increase your costs. Um, the next thing, which is an issue, of course, is the uh, equipment out there that has to handle both V4 and V6. Most of the um, commercial routing systems, the ones that are used by internet service providers or enterprise operators, are capable of running both V4 and V6. Uh, some may require some upgrades, certainly software, but they may also, they may also require uh, physical um, expansion in order to handle larger routing tables. Uh, but uh, some serious work needs to be done there. The more critical thing for the general public is that a lot of the home routers are in fact not capable of running IPv6. I don't know what their reaction would be if a v6 packet showed up. They might fall over, they might simply throw the packet away. But somehow we have to find incentives 
not only for the makers of these residential uh, routing boxes or combination router net boxes, um, uh, we need to find incentives not only for the makers to create a V6 capability for them, but for the users to conclude that they want to acquire and install that capability. Um, I'm not sure what the right tactics are. I think of uh, the American program of uh, cash for clunkers where your car consumed too much uh, gasoline per mile and uh, the U.S. government actually offered to provide you with a subsidy to go buy a more fuel efficient car. You know, maybe we should have a uh, uh, you know, cash for uh, router clunkers or something like that. And by the way, not my idea. Rod Beckstrom at ICANN is the one that uh, uh, I think uh, half uh, tongue in cheek. Uh, suggested the idea, but you know it might be worth considering something to provide incentive for uh, the uh, general public to acquire uh, dual mode routers that uh, could also make use of either of the two uh, protocols. Uh, we also need to worry about the domain name system, uh, and there are several issues here because the name servers need to be able to handle the larger IPv6 packets. Uh, and certainly when we're talking about uh, the hint files and the uh, updates that come for what the current uh, uh, top level uh, route, uh, sorry, the um, root zone servers addresses look like uh, when you use v6 addresses that takes up more room and in fact uh, the, um, uh, the list of all of the 13 uh, root zone servers expressed in IPv6 is bigger than a typical um, you know, minimum size packet. So uh, here we either need EDNS0 to be implemented or we need the ability to switch from UDP to TCP uh, in order to handle larger uh, responses. That's going to take some real work to get the name servers and the resolvers that are out there and in use in the hundreds of thousands and millions maybe to uh, be upgraded to handle both V4 and V6. Again, I uh, would like you to think a little bit more about specific things that the various players in this uh, zoo uh, could uh, take, actions that they could take, and incentives for them to do that so that we uh, end up uh, with a fully functional IPv6 internet. Uh, it's obvious that right now the way things are going, which again, too slowly, uh, is that we have islands of IPv6 implementation, but we don't necessarily have connectivity, hence my concern about peering and transit policies. Uh, but we also have a very significant fraction of the general public with inability to handle v6 and domain name systems that are uh, old and out of date uh, and really need to be upgraded not only to improve their security, uh, but also to improve their ability to serve up both IPv4 and v6 responses as well as accepting IPv4 and IPv6 transported queries. Uh, I'm sure that you'll be able to think of some additional things that ought to be done, and uh, perhaps at the conclusion of the uh, meeting that you're attending, uh, someone could undertake to uh, summarize ideas that you might have for uh, creating these incentives. Uh, I have even taken the trouble of going to speak with the President's Science Advisor, John Holdren, and his deputy, Tom Khalil, about the possibility of, of a White House um, a spotlight, some kind of a, a convening of uh, players uh, in this game, to talk about things that people could reasonably do. Uh, I don't think that we should be simply uh, pointing our fingers at people and uh, beating the drums and raising alarms without actually suggesting some very concrete, very uh, reasonable and implementable things that, uh, that could be done that have reasonable business incentives behind them. Uh, just to finish up, my honest belief about business incentives is that, at least for the internet service providers, is that your business is to sell internet service, and generally speaking, you need an IP address to sell to a customer or in order for the customer to make use of the internet access service. When you run out of IPv4, and if, like me, you don't believe that NATs are the solution to everything, you clearly need more addresses, and the only answer to that is IPv6. So I think it's in every ISP's best interest to implement uh, both the protocols uh, in the near term. I also think that there are arguments that some, where someone says, oh, I have enough IPv4 address space, I'm not going to run out, I don't need IPv6. I think that's a bogus argument because the party that might want to use your services may only be able to get to you through IPv6 at some point, uh, perhaps uh, after the middle of 2011. So uh, that's my little homily from the uh, internet uh, evangelists 
uh, I appreciate very much your willingness to let me uh, greet you in this uh, virtual event style. And I really do wish you a very, very successful conference. I will measure that success by the kinds of suggestions that come back about how we can get people moving uh, towards implementation of v6 before the v4 address space runs out. So uh, have a very, very uh, you know, successful conference. And in the meantime, I'll see you on the net. All right. Thank you, Vint. So I think uh, there probably aren't any questions. So we're going to um, <laughs> keep carrying on. We have uh, Yamanishi-san from uh, SoftBank. Uh, it is great honor for me to speak as a, uh, to uh, to give to give a talk in this conference. Uh, also, uh, in front of two, quite so many uh, so many people. Uh, let me introduce myself. My, I'm Masato Yamanishi, and I'm working in SoftBank Group. And until uh, this merge, I was working in headquarters. So I did this uh, this project with my co-author. But from this April, I start work in LA office. So uh, now peeling, uh, including IPv6, is, is now part of my responsibility. So if you have some interest, please call me in, in this conference or in Nano in next week. Then uh, I also have one co-author who is uh, Satoru Matsushima, and he's also working in SoftBank Group. And uh, may, maybe uh, some people already know him about his contribution for MPLS. Okay, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our case study for IPv6 deployment. Uh, SoftBank Group is providing Yahoo, Yahoo Broadband service, uh, which is one of the largest ISP in Japan. Then, uh, yeah, before, before talking, talking about our project, I would like to summarize our requirement for IPv6 deployment and also IPv4 transition. Then in the transition state from IPv4 to IPv6, we should consider uh, we cannot assign new global IPv4 address for new, only for new subscribers because existing subscribers already have a global IPv4 address, so we need to consider for, for them. Also, uh, we, another point is the network, especially access network may have only IPv4 capabilities, or in some case, only IPv6 capabilities. So uh, we, ha we already have many deployment solutions for each, ca for such cases, but requirement of e each network provider are different. different depending on for existing subscriber or new subscriber, or for existing infrastructure or newly developed infrastructure, then this network has IP only has, has only IPv4 capability or has only IPv6 capability. So uh, this, pre this presentation only shows our showcase. It's depend on our requirement. So uh, since requirement for of each provider may vary, so uh, different 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 keys uh, will be appropriate for your network. But still, we have common requirement uh, between all ISP. Uh, of course, we should provide both of IPv4 and v6 connect connectivity. Then no more IPv4 global address. Then third point and fourth point is also very important. Third point is no additional R by IPv6, nor sharing global IPv4 address. So we should minimize CapEx and OPEX. Then fourth point is keeping a record of IP address assignment is very important. And it is mandatory because we, uh, it is mandatory. And also scalability of this function is very important. I will talk about later uh, more detail. Then this slide shows an uh, overview of Japanese ISP industry. And then I think next presenter, Tater Ichiro, uh, will talk about more detail. But important point is mainly uh, NTT is providing uh, last one mile access and also network, metal network in prefecture, in each prefecture. So uh, we should depend on their access network. 
in, in many case. Then currently we have two types of access network. First one is ADSL access network, and the second one is FTTH. And in ADSL access network, uh, we build a pure IP-based access network. Not it, it, it is not PPPoE based. Then uh, by leasing layer one or layer two circuits from NTT and other carriers. Then in this network, number of subscriber is slightly digressing because in Japan ADSL user is now moving to FTTH. So uh, in FTT, FTTH access network, uh, we build lay, only layer three network. Uh, it means we are leasing layer two connectivity from NTT. So uh, also in this case, number of subscriber is increasing very rapidly. Okay, let me, let me skip this slide. Then uh, in, as first, uh, as first case, uh, let me introduce our our case study in ADSL access network. As as I talked previously, uh, in ADSL access network, we don't need to consider how to provide IP VPO connectivity because mainly a uh, number of subscriber is decreasing. So uh, existing subscriber already have IP VPO global address. So we only need to consider how to provide IPv6 connectivity over ADS over this network. But it is a big problem because our ADS access, net access network is IPv4 only network. Then replacing or upgrading all devices to enable IPv6 is not realistic. So uh, we will need 6 over 4 technology to provide IPv6 connectivity. Another point is we can control, control software in CPE, but, but on the other hand, we want to minimize configuration cost of CPE because configuration of CPE is our responsibility. So uh, we choose 6LD. I think many people are already familiar with 6LD, so I don't want to explain the detail of 6LD, but the reason why we choose 6LD is it is very automatic solution. IPv6 prefix for, for subscriber is derived from global IP prefix address and also CPE. So it means CPE can automatically configure. Also, 6LD delay router is very simple. It can automatically form encapsulation header from destination IPv6 address. And also CPE can, uh, can figure out tunnel endpoint very easily from destination IPv6. So it means 6LD is a very scalable and cost-effective solution. So in its cost uh, simulation, uh, we assumed uh, we can use same server for tunnel-based solution and also 6LD solution. Then uh, we also assume uh, traffic per customer. IPv6 traffic per customer is 2.33 kbps. It is very uh, few compared with IPv4 one. But anyway, uh, in 6LD exp uh, experiment, uh, result shows single server can support uh, 430,000 customers. So it, it's quite a huge number. But on the other hand, in, if we will use tunnel-based solution, this same single server only can support 15,000 customers because tunnel solution is used, you should handle Ton should handle tunnel uh, for each subscriber. So it means it has big impact for cost. So uh, it, from, from, from our simulation, uh, 6LD only needs just less than 10% less than of the other solution, the cost of 10, the other solution. Okay, uh, from this slide, uh, let me talk about our case study for FTTH access network. And uh, NT current in Japan, uh, NTT uh, assigned their own IPv6 address. Uh, then its address is not for the, uh, for the internet con connectivity. Also, number of customer is increasing very rapidly. So we need to provide both of IPv4 and IPv6 service over NTT's network. So we should share IPv4 global addre address, uh, address between multiple customers. So we have big question. Actually, it's not question only for us. It is a common question between Japanese ISP. 
So first one is how to provide our or ISP's IPv6 service over NTT's IPv6 network. And also second question is how to share one IPv4 address with many customers. Then, uh, <laughs> yeah, many people laugh, uh, laugh by, by this, right? Anyway, uh, we have, we, we, we mean Japanese ISP has currently two candidate solution. Uh, first one is called Plan 2. So it means there are missing Plan 1 and Plan 3. But anyway, uh, first one is Plan 2. And in Plan 2 is basically based on PPP or PPP OE in IPv4 case. But difference, it has big, big difference compared with IPv4 case. It, it is uh, IPv6 address, which is assigned to subscriber, is, uh, comes from entity's network. And this prefix cannot be loudable to the internet. It can be only used uh, service in entity network. So to, uh, to use service on the internet, uh, we, need, we need NAT in the net. OK, thanks. And plan four is uh, basically based on native routing. Uh, the prefix which is assigned to each user comes from these ISP. So this address can be used for, uh, can, can be used for the service on the internet. Then, uh, yeah, this is a big difference between Prom 2 and Prom 4. Then, uh, yeah, also uh, we, need, we need another solution to provide IPv4 connectivity over, over this network. We already have uh, various solutions, include, including DSLine, LSN, or DSLine A plus B. Then we think critical point is scalability for keeping a record of IP address assignment and, and port number assignment if we, 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 we will use NAPT. Then uh, this slide is talking about uh, comparing LSN and A plus P. And all of them use layer 4 port number as a, port, as a part of host identifier. So uh, what is major technical difference? Uh, major difference is uh, there is two major difference. First one is port assignment aspects. Uh, LSN uh, assign port for each session whenever a new session is initiated. But A plus P and LSN with fixed port assignment assigns port for each subscriber when IP address is assigned to them. So it, it, it is big difference. Then another point is location of ad location of address and a port transition. Uh, LSN is, is center side and M plus P is CP side. The, uh, actually, address sharing technique techniques techniques uh, have a lot of common issues, but uh, yeah, like source port source port number should be logged to access log. To access log on server side, it, actually it has big impact for server side, and also max number of concurrent sessions for each user is limited. It, it is also another impact for server side, and uh, third one is security. Security since randomness of port number is restricted, so it may have some impacts for security, and uh, fourth one is some protocol which contain layer for port number in its payload may be impacted, and LG may be needed. But uh, these issues are common for uh, all solution to uh, uh, to all 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 other sharing solution. So uh, and, and and we think we should overcome and we can do it. We believe so. But remaining at hardest issue is scalability of LSN itself. And uh, this calculation uh, is talking about uh, scalability of LSN with dynamic port assignment. Uh, it has two points. First one is session table on LSN box. Then uh, since port port number is assigned for each session, so uh, we need to. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, size of size of log, log size per session is 
uh, 12 byte. And this number, I mean, 90 million session. It is a peak uh, maximum number of a concurrent session per million users. Actually, it comes from our real traffic data. And so it means session table, and the size of the session table is 228 megabytes. It's, so, it's not so big, but session log size Session storage size is very uh, big, big problem. So because uh, one million user genera generate uh, 8.6 giga session per day, it also comes from our tra real traffic data. So we need 31 terabyte storage to store six months long. So it has very big impact. Okay, then it is last right. Uh, so uh, our de IPv6 deployment plan is as follows. Uh, as first step, we will use 6LD uh, for uh, ADSL subscriber and also for some existing FTTH subscribers because they already have IP global IPv4 address, so we can use it for IP 6LD. Then now uh, we are start, now we are start to provide for existing FTTH customers. Then uh, second step is uh, plan four. I think it has it has uh, official name, but I forget it. So ask to Ichiro. Then anyway, we will use it for FTTH subscribers in future. Maybe we can start this sort this type of service from uh, next April next April. And then it's it's highly depend on schedule of MTT side. So please hurry up. Then uh, to keep IPv4 connectivity, we are still investigating which one is better, which one is cost effective and scalable. Uh, yeah, um, our first candidate candidate is A plus B, but still we are investigating. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We have about five minutes for questions before uh, Mizukoshi san gets up. If you want to ask now, please, yeah, do so. Um, I, Alan Joran from Geneva. Um, I was looking at your data about logging. This is a very interesting question and very important data. Um, have you considered techniques to reduce the size of these logs? What does it mean by visual, visual size? Uh, no, the actual size of a log. So you're talking about 30 terabytes mm -hmm. per six months. Uh, but there are techniques that you can look at that instead of logging every single port that is allocated, yeah. you can log clusters of ports, buckets of ports, and you can divide by 10 or by 100 of this size. So you can go from 30 terabytes in your case to maybe 3 terabytes or 0.3 terabytes. That may make your problem much, much easier to handle. Mm, yeah, I understand we can reduce this this size, but since port is dynamically assigned, so I'm not sure 0 0.3. Um, Certainly, we can we can tank we can talk kilobyte offline load. about okay. how to achieve that. Okay. But there, mm -hmm. there are techniques that will help you to reduce the amount of log that you need to maintain on disk. Okay, thanks. I'm Jim Mehta, the ISC. Uh, I have a question about uh, the, uh, the, the scalability of the 6RG server. You mentioned it can support uh, 15K customers or something like that. And uh, sure. I'm just curious about, oh, am I correct about the number? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my question is about the, uh, so um, yeah. how heavy was that server working? I mean, if the uh, traffic is lightweight, uh, it, of course that can support more, more and more number of customers. So, um. sure, you point out a very good point. Uh, we assumed uh, two points. We assumed IPv6 traffic per customer is 2.3 kbps, so it's quite a small number. Then in 6LD, limitation comes from volume of traffic, not not number of session. But tunnel-based solution, uh, limitation of tunnel-based solution comes from number of session mainly. So that's the big difference. I see. The the to underscore, you, you, the, the 6RD limitation was 430,000, not sure. 15,000. Okay. It's the, it's the 
the other thing, not 6RD, that was 15,000. Sure. sure, sure. Uh, uh, 430, yeah. Sure, thanks. And Alain Durand, Jennifer, uh, there are two limitations here that may be different and happening at different points. One is the total number of users that the box can handle because they have to keep context for some of that, and 6RD is essentially stateless for that, so it's easy. The other one is the bandwidth. And uh, it sure. may be that if there is very little traffic, because I yet have to see a service provider with a lot of this traffic, and we'll be happy to see that, but I've yet to see it. It may be that uh, the limitation is actually much, much higher because no, the V6 traffic aggregated is still very small, and the box can handle much more than that. So I think it's important to maintain the distinction in mind about the limitation, physical limitation of a box in terms of user, and physical limitation of a box in terms of bandwidth. Yeah, uh, this calculation is for uh, for for recent recent two or three years. So maybe five or five years later, result will be different. How much uh, CPU load do you see on the server? Because it seems that if the ser if the server is not busy, you can simply install a 10 gig NIC and get a no like three or four x scaling increase. Uh, I can not remember number, but Mm. I'm not sure uh, it can be resolved by taking in interface. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jerome Kose of Entities. I appreciate of this point opportunity to have this presenta presentation today. So now, oops. Oh, slide shows, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm from Tokyo, Japan, and uh, today, uh, so first of all, I to introduce our company, which is Entity East. Entity East stands for Nippon Telephone, Telegraph and Telephone East Corporation. Some of you may know that once there was a huge telecom public corporation called Entity, it's like former AT&T in USA. Uh, like AT&T, and was, AT&T was divided to long distance and baby bears in, like, in 1997. Entity was also divided into five main subsidiaries, including Entity East and some affiliated companies and a holding company. Entity East and West provide domestic telecom services, and we, we Entity East, uh, in charge of northern and eastern part of the Japan. Oops, sorry. Yes. So today I'm going to explain about our internet-related business. We have been providing access line for the internet, as I mentioned, said. Its service brand is called FRET. Service, serving access line by telecom company sounds pretty straightforward, I think, but it's quite unique architectures. Uh, Fritz itself is a very large IP network. To use this network as access line, we adapted one of VPN technology. It's based on PPPoE. Customer need to prepare a home gateway to terminate PPPoE, or in some case, PC by itself open PPPoE session to lack with various kind of lines like ADSA, FTTH, etc. So on. And the Tunnel is established between LAC and LSN, then LSN send IP packet to the ISP. And demarcation points are here and here. So in our own businesses, we don't provide internet access services. We only provide that access line. Why? This is the reason. This is Nano Satin T-shirt in 1998 at Miami. I'm quite sure of some of you are there and have T-shirts like me. Once ISP were very happy and enjoyed to carry IP packet, but Franken Bell was coming. It's a kind of joke for 20 years ago, but the session was still the same in Japan. Then as a result of ISP lobbying campaign and the compensation policy of Japanese government, we entities and the West are highly regulated in our business domain and tied up chain 
by government. So in spite of the fact that we have nationwide IPv4 and IPv6 data stack network, we can't be an ISP. The only thing what we allowed is to provide the access line by using our IP network, huge and close IP network. Well, I said various kind of line in previous slide. This is brief history of lineup. In July 2000, Fred's ISDN launched. Maximum speed was 64 kilobits. In December 2000, Fred's ADSL launched as broadcast broadband access services. At first, maximum speed was one mega, but now maximum speed is 47, 47 megabits for downstream. In August 2001, FTTH has begun. Maximum speed getting faster and faster. So, uh, so our customer maximum speed is 200 megabits for consumers now and one gigabit for business customers. And the last one, NGN, has started in March 2008. So there's a gap between 201 and 208. Do you think we have been crossing our arms during years? Do you think are we sweeping? No, we are preparing among something in coming era. In January 2004, we have started Threads.net, which is IPv6 based services. We have assigned IPv6 address to FTTH and ADS customers by request. So customers can connect each other by using IPv6, and consumer can receive multicast packet. Multicast, multicast is used for IPTV, which is served by other companies. But this IPv6 network is not connected to global internet. Our network is isolated, just like village in old British TV program, The Prisoner. Yes, it is protocol number six, just six protocol. So anyway. In June 2004, Fritzphone launched. Fritzphone is video telephony and, of course, running on IPv6. In September 2004, it is expanded to a traditional form. We call it Hikari Denwa. Hikari means right. In other words, fiber. Denwa means telephone. Yeah, so isn't it IP phone services? Yes, it is. But our guys, IP native people, doesn't like that word telephone, so now. Anyway, it began with IPv4, and we are moving forward to the on protocol number six. Then NGN starts in March 2008. What is NGN? From the perspective of podcast side, NGN is IT versus ITUT, telephone versus computer, and so on. <laughs> From the perspective of marketing side, NGN is fixed mobile convergence, new brand, and so on. But I'm an internet engineer. My understanding of NGNs running on IPv6 with SIP capability and guaranteed QoS. We have been experiencing such features since 2004, so NGN will repackage them with a new brand name, Fritz. Got it next. Oh, I forgot to introduce new two, uh, two features. Uh, FMC is missing in the Fritz next due to regulations. And Fred's Next is running on only on fiber. So uh, before going to maintain IPv6 access on Fred's Hikari Next, this is the last slide of our of background information. This is our scale on March 2010. These are numbers of subscribers. FTTH includes both traditional FTTH and Fred's Hikari Next. We started Fred's Hikari Next two years ago. Number of customers are going smoothly, more than 1 million per year. But we have huge number of traditional customers, and most of traffic is IPv4. So now I want to talk some numbers on IPv4 traffic for your, for your ears only. So we always handle almost 7.6 million sessions. At peak time, we send the packet to ISP at 320 gigabps and receive at 480 gigabps. Traffic growth is almost 150% in these two years, and per customer traffic growth is less than 20% in these two years. Uh, this is our scale. Also, oh, I have to talk about IPPs, IPv6. At peak time, we carry IPv6 packet at over 50 gigabps. 
Most of them are IPTV. So, somehow, I have just uh, maintained IPv6 access on entities NGN. Yes, uh, the technical most simple way is open the gate, break the world, let's connect our isolated village to the world. But for Frankie entity, it is too tough. Entity state cannot be now ISP, even in IPv6 era. So, by the ISP request, we are going to prepare two options. Uh, one is, yeah, uh, Yamanishi-san says, Plan 2, uh, V6 on PPPoE, and the other one is Plan 4, Quasi Native. Also, now, Plan 1 is uh, missing two plans. Plan 1 is uh, V6 on the, our V6 networks, and Plan 3 is that I said, open the gate, I mean, uh, connect our network to the internet. But as I said, it's too tough. So now, these two options, V6 on PPPoE and Quasi Native, is chosen. Yes, V6 on PPPoE is familiar to the Japanese ISP. Since it looks the same existing method, let's establish another tunnel for V6 on PPPoE. It's easy, but there are some weak points. Oh, sorry. For example, Oh, can I see it? Yeah. Using the toenail makes a shorter MTU. Uh, tomorrow, the Matt Zaki-san uh, will make presentation about this one. Yeah. And the Mata cast, yeah, we are already pre uh, deploying servicing. But Mata cast itself is hard because uh, duplicating the packets at, uh, oops, yeah, at here RSN is too expensive, etc. And the... Uh, Yamanisa also mentions we we fresh Hikari next uh, using using IPv6 for our dedicated services like Kali Denwa and IPTV and so on. So we provide we provide our IPv6 address and the ISP also provide their own address to customer. So this option will cause multi prefix problem. To avoid this problem, we need a remedy like ignore dedicated services adapting 66 NAT and having dedicate, uh, dedicated port on home gateway, etc. Oops, sorry. Oh, since this problem is quite complicated, so I have no time to talk detail in Mata prefix. If you want to know more, please catch me later if you can. So, yes, yeah. The next one, the quasi native. Quasi native another option. Yeah, it has a strange name. I want to say this option as native, but some ISP object to call this method as native. Native gives too much positive imagination to tone and sonar. Anyway, because native consists of two parts. One customer will be assigned one prefix only from ISP. IP packet dispatched by source address prefix at gateway between MGN and ISP. ISP they get the prefix to us, we allocate it to customer upon customer's request. We don't distinguish prefix from in our network. Our customer will get services from both ISP and MGN by using ISP's prefix. Only at oh yeah. Sorry. Only and only at this gateway. I mean, default gateway, exit point, packet is dispatched by source prefix, so customer can choose ISP for internet connectivity. And one more significant point on, of these options, communications between customers who had connected to our NGN directory, IP packets will not get to the gateway, even they are subscribed to a different ISP. As long as customers connect to each other in our network, they will be treated like same ISP's customers. Ah, yes, uh, this option also has a weak point. Number of ISP, oh, here, oh, here, these here, uh, uh, limit, uh, the number of ISP who can connect to the NGN directory is limited. Currently, this magic number is only three. Prefix size must be as long as ours, it's currently 23. So now, I can't predict which one, I mean, uh, PPPO on V6 or the Quasi Native. 
but um, uh, so the market will decide it. So this is the last slide. Yeah, to prepare the IPv4 exhaustion, we have made commitment with government. We start v6 on PPPoE on April 2011 and Quasnet. Yeah, Yamanistan requested to hurry up, but I only said it starts on in spring 2011. Yeah, of course, we want to start both of them as soon as possible, but our network is huge and telecom is too conservative. So this is our best guaranteed schedules. So now, yeah, so in talking about IPv6, so where is the application, where is the network? Yeah, it's a traditional chicken and egg controversy. But from April 2011, we'll provide IPv6 internet access environment to all of our ISPs in Japan and their customers. So I believe it will terminate the controversy and IPv6 will gain the status of the, as the internet infra infrastructures in this century. Thank you. We do have about uh, five minutes if somebody wants to has any questions for uh, music what you said. No. No? Yep. Oh, thank you thank very you. much. Uh, my name is John Brzezowski from Comcast. I'm here to tell you a bit about, oh, that's handy. Um, our, uh, the trials that we are conducting at Comcast, some of the things that we've seen, and ultimately I'm hoping to field a great number of questions from you all. Um, a little bit of background, um, and I actually will not use a great many of these slides here uh, because you may have already seen them already, and frankly, um, I I'd much rather talk to some of the points. Um, back in January, we announced our trials. We, we, announced, we announced a number of technology trials that we are conducting. Um, I'll talk about where we are actively in those that have either been started already or that are soon to be started um, or that will start in, in the very near future. Uh, first and foremost, we, um, we, we had our first commercial trial subscriber turned up on May 13th. Uh, that was a kind of a Metro E variety type of a commercial subscriber. Um, and uh, honestly, that was probably one of the, uh, probably the easiest of the trial technologies that we had to turn up um, for, for what we're planning on doing within Comcast. Uh, that went very smoothly, uh, and there was hardly, uh, it was actually the simplest to do from a technological point of view. Uh, that subscriber is still happily running along. Um, they are native dual stack using uh, Comcast address space, um, and I can provide some. I can talk to some of those details absent, you know, uh, the actual who the subscriber is, uh, and I can tell you a little bit more about what we have planned on the, in the commercial space as far as what some of the next steps are, uh, because you got to remember some of the things that we are aiming to do as part of these trials is to understand and vet out more of what we need to make sure that it gets kicked from a tire point of view, so that when we, you know, when we go and, and open it up to a wide scale enablement for production subscribers, we, we need to be able to uh, make sure that we support a wide variety of combinations, you know, everything from use of static routing to, you know, BGP and, and other things. Um, and, uh, you know, to be prudent, we have to make sure that we do that in, an, in, in a trial phase in advance of doing that for real subscribers. Um, so, so that's the commercial, the native dual stack commercial. Again, uh, that was fairly uneventful, but a very substantial um, achievement for Comcast. We have more of those planned uh, for the next, you know, 30 to, to uh, I'm sorry, 60 to 90 days. Uh, so expect more news from us on that front. Um, something else that you've heard us talk about uh, from a Comcast point of view trial is uh, our 6RD trials. So there may be actually people in this room who have received packages from me or somebody from Comcast with their, with their home networking equipment provided by Comcast um, for 6RD. Uh, so where we stand right now at 6RD, uh, probably in the next week or so, what we are going to do is actually enable the, the border relays for 6RD. Um, what we've done in advance of actually, we, we've kind of stepped through this, and, and, our, and our plan was basically to take these uh, these versions of home gateways that are running some, some at the time, specialized code, 
um, and make sure that there is a big period where if you're you know you're going to use it in a v4 only environment that nothing goes wrong everything everything works as expected in a v4 only environment and then when we enable and, and turn on the border relays which I like I said should happen in a week or so um, we want to make sure that there was a good baseline to build off of and then suddenly everybody will have 6rd oriented v6 access uh, we've placed uh, a pair of border relays and at a, at a couple of our national data centers. Um, and the initial trial base has it was kept to a fairly small number of people to make sure that that you know we could we could assess what was going on. That trial will expand to probably account for several hundred people before the end of the summer. Um, so, and, and some of you are on that list already. And if you're not, and you're a Comcast subscriber and you're interested, make sure you let me know. Um, some of the things that we've seen with the six with six RD, um, you know, for us, um, is it, it's largely a technology that that appear that, that we actually, you know, in, in conversations with people, we suggest, you know, if you have if you have an access network that is not natively capable of V6, uh, personally, I, I've kind of mentioned to people that it's really something that you should strongly consider. Uh, from a Comcast point of view, however, the vast majority of our access network will support native dual stack operation. So from our point of view. Uh, it's not clear, honestly, you know, if, if, if 6RD will be a part of our production enablement moving you know, into the future. Uh, we may use it at points in time to augment areas where we have delayed support for native dual stack, meaning if we have specific uh, access network vendors that have, you know, longer commitment dates as far as supporting native v6 is concerned, we, we may leverage kind of a limited 6RD infrastructure to support that. Um, but from our point of view, we kind of feel like if we're going to touch, if we're going to touch the home gateways anyway uh, for 6RD or whatever else, we're going to make sure that they support native IP6 operations. And we'll talk a little bit about that before before this, you know, before I'm, I'm done up here with the slides. Uh, one of the things that we did find is, um, and, and I know that there are probably many people in the room who can who can talk to this, they're um, absent the DHCP options for for the six for 6RD. Six uh, it, it seems it seems that a scalable deployment in a heterogeneous environment is, is somewhat complicated. Uh, we had to actually manually configure uh, the home gateways before we sent them out. That's, that's, that's not going to scale, right, to beyond, you know, e even a few hundred is going to be a problem, right? Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't change my opinion about, about what people, how people who have access network challenges, particularly from a native v6 point of view, how they should look at 6RD. If anything, those folks should actually be supporting strongly the 6RD DSP options to make sure that they get they get ratified. And, and honestly, there, there's still an implementation phase where DSP servers and home gateways are going to have to implement support for all these things. So from our point of view, this is one of the things that we've seen um, early on that we, we knew we kind of knew it was coming. That yeah, the absence of these DSP options in an environment like a cable environment where people buy their own home routers is going to be it's going to be very it will it will increase the complexity of Enabling 6RD in uh, you know, in certain types of environments. Uh, nonetheless, we still, you know, I, I still, you know, like I said, recommend that people who have access network challenges definitely uh, take a look at 6RD. We do not have any figures yet. Uh, I heard some folks who were here before me talk about performance and statistics. Uh, you know, stay tuned. Uh, we'll probably throughout the summer we'll be able to offer some feedback on that front um, and uh, and let you know what our experience is from a uh, from a from a from a border relay point of view. Um, last but not least, we'll talk about um, native dual stack uh, from a DOCSIS point of view. So this is basically, oh, and, and one thing about 6RD, because of the nature of 6RD, it's not limited to uh, to a geography, right? So we've actually included a number of people from all over the country, and uh, and uh, and like I said, many of those people have their have, have their gear ready, and that'll continue as we expand the trials to to the several hundred range. Mark, my father down in Alabama. Thanks, you, Joan. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Um, and and you mentioned something about the DHCP options. If it's not clear, uh, 6RD, the DHCP option has been assigned a code point by the IETF. It's 212, the uh, Manhattan area code. It's kind of cool. And it's just not the, the – <laughs> Yari's laughing. The, the RFC hasn't come out yet. It's in the RFC editor's queue. So the IESG has approved it. That opened the door for the code point. So you can start writing code to it. You don't have to use vendor specifics or anything to all the CPE vendors or DHCP vendors in here. 
Thanks. Thanks, Mark. So from a native dual stack point of view, this is this is the one for us that we that we believe is going to be central to our enablement strategy over you know for the for the foreseeable future. Um, and, and we thank Doxis 3.0 largely for this opportunity. Um, you know, we have, like I said, we have a largely a largely uh, Doxis 3.0 native IP6 cable access network. Um, and this is the part for us that is actually geographically bound for the trials, right? So as we've mentioned in our, in, you know, on our website and, and, and other kind of, you know, speaking things that we've done as, as Comcast, um, we are initially targeting uh, the Bay Area, Surprise, um, Chicago, or Chicago Metro, Philadelphia, because I live there, and, uh, and New England. So... Um, and uh, and right now we are targeting probably sometime in the July time frame before those things can get started. Uh, okay. So um, – and we will again keep you abreast of that. Now, some of the things that we are doing on the native dual stack front, we have worked very closely with a number of home gateway vendors. So to kind of pull a page out of Vince's kind of keynote message here, um, we, we agree with him, right? There are, there, you know, that, that's an area that, that – uh, that appears to be that, that, that we identified as an issue, you know, a while ago. Uh, so we have been very collaborative with a number of home networking vendors um, that, that build standalone routers, as well as home networking vendors that build routers that have cable modems embedded with them. Um, and there are actually some of those people here on both sides. Uh, so as part of our trials, we're actually going to leverage Apple's uh, Linksys devices and and at least a couple of makes and models for uh, from Netgear, um, all of which support native dual stack. Uh, some of them are actually fairly, um, I'll call them entry-level devices, um, uh, which is actually a very, a very promising sign, right? So folks who build home networking equipment here, uh, and you'll actually hear more about this later in the afternoon, uh, there's a CPE panel. You'll find that, you know, to Vin's point, there are a lot more people appearing that support IPv6 in some way, shape, or form in their, in their CPE products, which is a big deal. Uh, but I also have to admit, taking, a, you know, taking another page from Vince's slides, there are a number of things that, that came up as part of our, our preparation steps for getting ready for all these trials, right? Everything from those related to DNS to 6 to 4, right? So one of the things I will mention briefly, um, some of the things that we saw kind of in the, I, you know, the Anaheim IETF timeframe was uh, spikes in 6 to 4 traffic. So since then, we've, uh, we've essentially decided to stand up a, a limited infrastructure for, of, of 6 to 4 relays. Uh, because of some of the traffic volumes that we had seen, um, and, and given what what's happening, you know where, where the traffic was heading, and the fact that it wasn't, you know, there was only a single egress, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, we feel that this is something that we we should take care of sooner rather than later, so that it doesn't become something that we have to deal with as part of our production enablement for V6. Um, I, I I I voted for Eric Eric's talk on on DNS whitelisting because I do think as a community that's something that really we really do need to talk about. Um, uh, from a Comcast point of view, um, you know, we and, and as well as as Google, you know, we've we've kind of suffered through a lot of, of challenges on that front. Uh, I think it behooves us all to come to to come to some sort of conclusion there. Uh, I know from a Comcast point of view, our plan is basically to put quad A's on on our main internet at, at this time is to put quad A's on our main internet sites, uh, and we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, and uh, we may we may change our our plans at some point, but we're gonna we're gonna stick to that, and we're gonna do our best to to kind of weather the storm here and uh, and try to get to a point where quadies flow freely. Um, so I think I'm almost out of time here. Uh, in, in parting, I, I would encourage you if you're not aware of our trials, uh, you know, you know, stop up and see me. Visit our portal www.comcast6.net. Uh, if there's anything that you know you want to sign up for, you're on the list, man. Cameron. Uh, Cameron Byrne, T-Mobile. Um, do you see beyond – I know the content guys are going to talk, and we may likely talk about uh, whitelisting. Do you also see the potential for something of a loosely organized uh, flag day for IPv6 deployment? Uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's – I don't know, man. We, we, we've had the conversation it, in some way, shape, or form. I think as a, as a group, we got to – I think it's too soon to tell. I, I mean, that, that, that's been brought up. I just don't know. I don't know the answer. I think, I think that's going to have to be something that, as a community, we, we kind of get – you know. Get a handle on, Bob. Um, hi, I'm one of those customers who switched to Comcast because of this. Okay. Um, and I told, I gleefully told uh, my old ISP, Covet, why. Um, but and I have a Doxus 3 modem, and I'd really like you to add me to the trial. Where do you live, Bob? Um, Palo Alto. Here. I, um, I think I have your name, but I'll make sure. I can't. I, I can't imagine I'd miss you, but okay. Um, so the, the other thing that you'll that I, I'll, I'll share with you is is we've we've basically stood up. Are you going to ask me where your router is? 
dude, where's my cable modem? <laughs> it's in my hotel room at the West End in St. Francis. <laughs> I brought two extra. Personal delivery. What's that? Personal delivery. Personal delivery. Um, so last but not least, we, uh, you know, we did, uh, on the content front, we, we stood up a, a pair of uh, IPv6 dot sites, uh, ipv6.comcast.net, ipv6.comcast.com, and they're basically, they're basically translated or proxied version of the, the, the original content from comcast.net and comcast.com. We felt that that was an important step for us to take as part of our, you know, our trial planning to make sure. But we are working on making sure that there's proper enablement for the www sites, um, not, not nece- which does not necessarily mean that's going to be translated or proxied. Hey, Jason. Um, Matthew from Internode in Australia. We have started offering uh, native broadband to, to subscribers on an opt-in mm-hmm. basis as well. I'm just curious, f- for us, the network bit was sort of in some ways straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk briefly about how you're going with doing the non-network bit, like, e- like email? Uh, for us, much, much harder to get those guys in the billing systems and so on. I mean, obviously not sorry, deep dive, but what, what have you found the there? Back, so, so the billing systems touches on the back office, which yeah. by far was probably, you know, next to the access network, it was probably the, the most complicated thing that we had to do. Um, so many systems, so many servers that they all touched, that, that was pretty complicated. Email is something that we're looking at now. Uh, we're looking at taking some of the email systems, maybe putting some, you know, some, some, beta versions up to, to get to work on that. But there are other things that are going to go hand in hand with that, like like blacklists, yep. right, that essentially don't exist, mm-hmm. right? So it's it's a whole new area. I mean, we we'll do this next year, we'll probably be talking about that, right? I mean, that's that's going to happen, right? Cool. Eric? Oh, well, we're still good on time. I had a question uh, for you about uh, whether or not you are monitoring who can reach your, your IPv6 accessible uh, or your dual stack sites. We do. And We, uh, we have some you... statistics. Yeah. Anything? anything oh, so wait a minute. Share preliminary, like who, like you know, who can't read who? Uh, the broken stuff. Yeah, but who will be broken if you if you get so, a cloud data yeah. dot net? So we, I don't have anything to share right now, but um, you know, we've 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 kind of made a commitment to the to publicly that we're going to we're going to generate some of that and share it in a an anonymized fashion. I don't have anything right now. Well, so that's actually the difficult thing, right? Because we have some some data as well, but obviously, you know, privacy. You know, they they prevent they prevent us helping you. They, you know, I think they prevent you probably helping your customers to some extent. I'm not quite sure how to uh, how we, do you address we, that way without saying, you know, hey, I know that you're broken in your house, and can you can you fix your stuff? It yeah. sounds a little creepy, right? Uh, and we've had that we've had we've had that discussion as well. I, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that we have to work out. What up until now, what we've been doing is getting the mechanics down, right? The process by which we detect this brokenness, right? But what you do with it from there is a whole essentially a whole non-technical string of conversations that has to happen, right? Uh, yeah, some non-technical questions, but also a lot of technical uh, conversations, right? Yeah. There's a lot of analysis because you have to categorize all these things, yep. these brokenness things as well. Yep. So, You know, one of the things that we've said, um, that, we, that we've said as part of, you know, our, our, our V6 program and our commitment to trying to make it happen is, is you know, if we thought it was a, a small, you know, uh, well, a, you know, if we took some of the, the statistics that were out there, we'd be willing to actually mail people home gateways. To help fix the problem, and one of the things that that, I, that you will note, pick, you, know, you know, I said this for the 6RD stuff as, as well, and applies for the native dual stack. Part of this is you will get a home gateway from Comcast um, that supports IP6. Right? So whether it's you know for, for trial use as part of the uh, and, and it, we, you know this is part of making sure that we had that gear, that we tested it, and make sure it works. So that was a tangent. So yeah. it, it is a big it, what you're describing is a big issue. Eric. But yeah, but you still have to go out and contact all these people and say we're sending. Because we're broken, or just maybe send it anonymously, like wrapped in a Christmas. So box. we've we've had, we, we've had that conversation internally, and believe it or not, you know we've there, there are some things that we've done to proactively um, get older technology out of the network, right? So like Docs one O modems, right? They were EOL, and we've kind of proactively interacted with subscribers to kind of to kind of remedy that situation. Um, it doesn't, um, you know, it's it's not, um, and and that seems to have been fairly effective, right? So maybe that's something that. Looks and smells like what you know an opportunity there. That sounds like there's an existing channel actually. That's a good idea. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I suppose we should be having this um, conversation tomorrow when we're going to be talking about the uh, state of V6 and the internet. Um, but um, so if you're interested in this problem, which is one of the major problems from a content provider perspective, you know, please you know show up tomorrow and discuss, and hopefully we'll have some useful discussion there. Um, just think about it. Um, uh, six to four is um, apparently to blame from given our measurements for a lot of this. Um, um, it might be worth investigating if you have the possibility of 
finding users that are spitting out six to four packets and saying, hey, you're using six to four and would you like this new modem or something? <laughs> well, it'll be a new home router. But let me ask you this question. I mean, in some cases, six to four, given the nature of the protocol, which, you know, I'm not hugely a fan of, um, um, you know, if one of the things that we see is that uh, as benefit of standing our own relays up is like right now, at least we have some uh, the ability to kind of make it, you know, and pardon, pardon my kind of my 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 use of adjectives here, but suck less. Right? I, I don't I don't really aim to make it really great, to be honest with you. But I mean, I, you know, I, I just I'll be honest with you, I don't want to be in the middle of something that's like, you know, a wide scale enabler and then find out like, oh, crap, I have to go deal with 64 now. Right. Doing it, you know, putting it on your infrastructure is the right thing to do. But um, also encouraging users. Maybe you can put things on the website saying, hey, you're blinking box. But yeah, you know, and just as an, just as a side note, I, I I hear that there's actually changes going around in some of the in some of the home networking for, home some home networking vendors code where 64 will be enabled. Uh, I'm sorry, disabled by default in in a lot more cases, in, in, uh, compared to what what uh, what's happening today. Uh, Frederick, last question. Okay, Frederick Eriksson. Uh, since we have Google and Comcast talking to each other here, uh, something for the history books. Um, you you uh, you Come announced. On, <laughs> no, no, not that. <laughs> I think you're talking to to each other. But uh, in in the very end of of January, Google enabled uh, uh, YouTube, and then within a week, you did your um, announcement of your trial. Since we're in the U.S., was this a joint strike? Nope. No. No, that was just that a happy was, coincidence. Yeah, purely okay. independent. In fact, I think until about three hours before we launched YouTube, it was not clear when we would launch yeah. YouTube. But I, I'm a kind, so kind of a, <laughs> a conspir of a conspiratory guy because you were both in the Atlas report as as the case studies, Comcast and, and YouTube. So, and, and you did this. So it's it seems like you're really you're talking to each other, and we're not listening. Great anymore. minds think alike. Yeah. Yeah. Really, we just Much thought this that, is yeah. today's a good day. Let's turn it on and go for lunch. It was at 1 p.m. That that was all. Yeah, good. Thanks. Thank you, John. I think this needs to be the end of the recording session.